Frank Diaz. Frank Diaz is a professor of music education at the Jacobs School of Music at Indiana University, right next door to Illinois from me over here. He is also the director of the Institute for Mindfulness, Mindfulness Based Well-Being and Pedagogy. So he's going to talk to us about about wellness and some uh, techniques that we can use to help ourselves. So if Frank's in here, without I'm any here. further ado, oh, there he is. Without any further ado, Dr. Frank Diaz. Hey, hello everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, you know, 20 bucks for anybody who can figure out where I am. Uh, there'll be a connection uh, to, to this particular <laughs> space at the end. Actually, this is a, this is a, 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 my safe space when I was a little kid. Um, yeah, that's right. Some of you are, it's Mr. Rogers house. And, and when I was, uh, when I was a young man growing up in Miami, uh, you know, I didn't have cable. Uh, so, but, but I did have PBS and, uh, and PBS was like, you know, sort of like a, a little place that I can go to, to hear calm voices and reasonable people and, and good shows. And one of those was Mr. Rogers and I'll get back to Mr. Rogers at the end, believe it or not. So I am going to talk to you today about well-being, and, um, uh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you, John Ryan, for inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you know, for, for taking the time uh, to do this for teachers. Uh, I always uh, learn so much just from the chat. Uh, uh, I can't, there's so many incredible things going on and so much in interesting information happening in the chat. So I, I, this is always just a great opportunity to learn as well. I'm going to be talking about well-being and mental health today, and I'm going to be talking about it from the perspective of something called contemplative practices, which you might know of by the sort of umbrella term mindfulness. Uh, you might also know related terms like social emotional learning, stress reduction techniques. And what I would like to do today is talk about uh, some of these techniques, uh, especially ones that are easy to use that you can start using this year right away. Um, and that, uh, believe it or not, actually are pretty easy to use with students. So even though I'm going to be focusing on the teacher primarily, uh, all of the techniques that I'm talking about today, you can use with your kids. You can do it in a learning management system. You can do it on Zoom. Um, uh, you can do it with any age group with little adaptations. And um, I, you know, as a practitioner of these particular techniques, use it uh, with my own students at the Jacob School who are incredibly stressed out. Um, use them with, uh, use them with uh, kids when I go work honor groups like middle school and high school honor orchestras. Uh, they, you know, I incorporate them into what we do. Uh, so I, I hope by the end, uh, if you're not familiar with these techniques, that they don't come off as something really weird or esoteric. Actually, a lot of these are, are very uh, soundly founded on good scientific principles. And although we won't focus a whole bunch on that, I will talk about those a little bit as we go along, because I like to give evidence-based information rather than just making it up <laughs> as I go. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen with you. Let's see, this should work. Okay, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see mindfulness, wellness, and social emotional learning during the pandemic with the 45 titles that I put on everything and all the little logos and everything else, which I'll skip here in a minute. I want to point something out that I think is really important for all of us to understand as we as we get into this year for ourselves and for our kids. There's this interesting um, uh, there was an interesting study that was done in both I believe it's 2004 through 2008 and 2016 through 2018. It's called the World Happiness Report. And what they do is uh, essentially uh, a group of psychologists and, and uh, people who create surveys and scales um, have created a, a sort of, of a measurement of world happiness. And it's based on things like how safe do you feel? Um, how, how well do you feel your income uh, you know, contributes to your ability to be, meet basic needs? Do you feel like you live in a democracy uh, where your views are respected, right? So what they do is they create this, this really complex questionnaire and they send it out to different countries around the world. Their governments send it out to their people and they collect an, an incredible amount of data and, and they kind of give you a rating on how happy they think your country is, right? And so what's, what's very interesting about this is in 2002, 2016 to 2018, um, the United States, which is usually among somewhere, has historically been somewhere among the top 10, is down to about 19. Now, this is 2018. Uh, you know, the latest, it was a two-year span there. We have dropped quite a bit uh, in terms of our happiness. And what these little bars on the right-hand side indicate are reasons why we're not happy. And I don't, you know, again, we don't want to get into all the research. So, for example, purple might represent, you know, how, 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 
healthy do you feel? Uh, how much, what's your work-life balance like, right? All of these indicate particular averages and particular metrics having to do with well-being. We have dropped, and what I'm not showing you here is that um, not only did we drop at 19, we are now the 123rd worst country in the world for a drop. So in other words, we have dropped so much that we're, we're close to uh, what you would call unindustrialized, sort of um, incredibly poor countries in terms of the drop in happiness. That is really concerning for lots of reasons, especially the fact that this is happening pre-pandemic, right? We were already pretty sad. Sorry to start so dark. I promise there's a silver lining here, okay? Well, it won't stay dark forever. <laughs> so many of you already know uh, uh, about this, so, but, but it's good to point out that, that, that there's research and things have come out about it in the last few months. Um, COVID has obviously exacerbated these issues. Uh, there's pretty good uh, research coming out from, um, uh, from Har uh, Massachusetts General Hospital about depression on the rise due to COVID-19. Uh, specific reasons are um, lack of access to mental health care, uh, and also, uh, no surprise, lack of resources, you know, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to have a job. And then, strangely, or maybe not, depending on how you want to look at it, because I think this is really important for us, loneliness. People are lonely. Uh, and we know that loneliness and lack of social interaction is really critical for well-being. Uh, college students are experiencing it. And another really interesting finding, which uh, for those of you who work in communities that are um, low SES, uh, students of low SES backgrounds, or who come from diverse communities, I want to point out that women, minorities, people with pre-existing health conditions are all suffering at a, a higher rate. Uh, than, than, than most of the population. So if that is you, or if that is a person, uh, a kid that you work with or staff that you work with, be aware that folks in this particular demographic are suffering quite a bit more. Okay, so what do we know? Right? Again, a lot of this will seem obvious, but it's good to just sort of pinpoint very specifically what happens when people feel distress. And by the way, I noticed I used the word distress rather than stress. Stress is actually perfectly fine. You should feel a little stressed, right? Uh, that that just means that you're you're motivated. There, there's a sense that you want to do well. Most of us handle stress okay. What we don't handle well is distress, which is when we don't have the resources to handle that particular stress in a successful way. And from just basic Mayo Clinic sort of overviews, here's here's some things that you might be relating to. Uh, distress causes uh, sleep issues or fatigue, muscle tension and headaches. Um, causes irritability, anxiety, lack of motivation, depression, and then some behavioral uh, outcomes like social withdrawal, outbursts, and substance abuse. So uh, this is a serious issue. Um, and as you can imagine, with the pandemic, specifically this at the bottom, substance abuse is up quite a bit among the population. So I, I know many of us have experienced some of the things on here and, are, and, and maybe experiencing at a higher magnitude right now. What about musicians, right? So we are musicians ourselves. We, I do research and work on the specifically musicians' uh, psychological concerns. Um, and this is just based uh, on a recent study that my colleagues, uh, Jason Silvera and Kathy Strand published in the JRME. We just kind of looked at undergraduates, right? People who are just transitioning from high school to college, uh, they're pre-service teachers. And I imagine that these results are probably generalizable to a lot of people. What do musicians uh, experience? Well, they experience anxiety. Uh, quite a bit of overwhelm, quite a bit of self-doubt, poor concentration, and, and distractions, right? Um, th these are five sort of symptomological uh, 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 variables having to do with just well-being. So I'm going to talk about mindfulness. This is my particular area of research. I am not just a mindfulness scholar. I kind of look at a lot of different things, but mindfulness is sort of the central thing that I work on. And I want to sort of frame this for you in a, what, what I think is a really, really simple way. When people ask me, what is mindfulness? What I basically tell them is, is there's, it's a set of mental skills. It's just a set of psychological skills that you can develop just the way you can develop good intonation, just the way you can develop good reading skills that, that, that can be cultivated either through everyday activities, attitudes, or specific practices. And um, here just, these are four things that pretty much every mindfulness practice will teach you. One is um, attention to the present moment. So it's the idea that we get to choose what we attend to rather than it choose us. So an example of this is if I'm trying to concentrate on getting ready for school next year, but my mind is consistently drawn to problems that I might have or issues uh, behind, you know, that were behind me or, or just sort of regret, I can't pay attention to what's going on because my mind is just so consumed with what might happen that I'm unable to attend to what's going on right now. What do I know right now at this moment, right? So learning to pay attention to the present moment is important. Emphasizing openness and curiosity. So 
this is the idea that as we experience these things, we don't judge ourselves. We don't sit there and go, gosh, I'm a terrible person because I don't know what's going to happen in the fall. Well, if you don't know what happens, what's happening in the fall or when COVID is going to end or what's going to happen with your job, welcome to the world right now. This is almost everyone. We're all experiencing this, right? So, so while it's, while it's absolutely normal to be upset about this, we can step back a little bit and actually tell ourselves this is normal to be upset about this. Um, it's normal not to know rather than make it a problem, trying to be a hero or trying to solve everything for everyone. And I bring that up because teachers are particular, mar we're martyrs, right? We've been conditioned to be martyrs. We're going to save the world. We're going to save all our kids. We're going to take them on the chin and, and not to get, you know, too, too dark here. We're going to go to school next year in certain situations and risk our lives for our kids because that's just what's expected of us, right? So you can see how just being able to say, I'm frustrated about that is really helpful rather than, oh, I should feel better. I should, I should really, uh, I should have a different attitude about this. So we emphasize openness and curiosity, intentional and non-judgmental attention. So we're, we're more curious about how to solve an issue and understand it rather than be too obsessed about what's wrong. And then awareness of our thoughts and feelings. If we're actually not aware that we're feeling this way, it can become incredibly difficult. Uh, someone says I'm breaking up. Uh, is that John? Are you, are you hearing me break up as I go through this? I, I'm hearing you fine. Okay. My end. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm going to, okay. I'm going to keep going then. So these are the four things and we can sort of talk about practices that, um, that help promote these things. All right. So by the way, is there evidence? Yeah. Hundreds and thousands of studies, people who practice even short bursts of mindfulness have decreased anxiety, better management of stress. They're less reactive. Ah, uh, improved sleep. Anybody want to improve to sleep? <laughs> I think so many of us could just use a little bit better uh, sleep quality right now. Um, this is new, which I really love as a teacher who, uh, as a person who works with pre-service teachers. Uh, mindfulness actually helps reduce implicit bias in a lot of teachers. There's some pretty interesting data coming out about that, uh, where teachers are more aware of their implicit biases and are less likely to act on them, which I think is really, really critical, and increases in pro-social feelings and behavior. So things like kindness and compassion, which we really, really desperately need right now as we struggle together through this process, tend to increase uh, uh, as, as we practice mindfulness. Right. Sounds like a magic cure, right? Uh, lots of stuff. But um, let me get to some practices. Uh, actually, a, a little little brain network stuff before. I have four practices I want to share with you. Um, is this brain-based? Yeah. What we basically know is that mindfulness practices target five areas of five brain networks, if you will. Our learning network, which is our, our ability to focus and sustain focus. Um, uh, it also targets our, it, our ability to get away from the default mode network, which is the network that's involved in ruminating and daydreaming. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with rumination and daydreaming, uh, except when you don't want to be daydreaming. <laughs> Uh, if you want to daydream, that's awesome, but you might not want to be daydreaming during something important. Rumination, though, is a different thing. Rumination is when we spin something in our heads over and over again that we can't solve, right? And so uh, we label this as sort of distraction in this model. And noticing that distraction, noticing, whoa, what's happened to my mind is part of what mindfulness targets. And we do this through what we believe uh, is through activating some uh, components of the salience network, which, uh, which are deeply embedded parts of your brain. The executive network, many of you have heard of executive function before, uh, without getting into specific brain parts, well, all this is telling you is that um, when you practice mindfulness, you're able to let go of distracting thoughts a little bit better than you typically would. And then shifting back to what we need to go. So uh, these are all elements of brain neurology that are affected by mindfulness practices. And we have some pretty good data indicating that. But let's do some practices, okay? And I actually want you to try these with me as we go. I don't want you just to go, oh, that's really interesting. I think uh, the proof is in the pudding. Um, and, and I think it's really important that as, as we go through this presentation, if you can, uh, you do this with me. So the first thing I'm going to teach you is uh, something called the uh, vagus toning, or uh, I could just call it breathe it down. And it is a technique that comes from research on post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there's a really interesting researcher here at the at Indiana University that looks at people who have panic attacks and people who become overly, their bodies become overly aroused to the point that they can't control what's going on. So you can imagine kids with trauma and PTSD or yourself can experience something like that. And the worst thing we can tell a person in that situation is calm down. I always tell people if you could, if I could actively calm down, 
<laughs> with, by just thinking, calm down, I would be a much happier person. Uh, so what we know is essentially one of the reasons this happens is because uh, we have uh, an activation of our sympathetic nervous system, right? Our sympathetic nervous system is our fight or flight response. And that can be triggered without you even being aware of it. You can just have something in your environment that triggers it. You could have had a bad night of sleep. And this particular technique uh, uses measured breathing, which is a way to sort of access the sympathetic nervous system through the vagus nerve, which is uh, a part of your brain that's connected to your body. It's kind of like a relay signal. You can't tell your body to can't calm down, but you can ask it to slow down. So uh, the directions are here, and it's actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting to um, uh, just go through really quickly. First of all, you can do this laying down or, si or, or, um, or sitting. So go ahead and sit or lay down if you want to. Make sure your body is uh, fluid. So in other words, you know, not too tight, not too loose. And then what I'm going to ask you to do is we're going to take in four counts of, of breath through our nose and fill up our bellies. And you're going to hold your breath for about seven counts, not, you know, tightly, just sort of suspending the breath. You're going to breathe out for eight counts, but you're going to breathe out in a very special way. You're going to put your tongue behind your teeth and make this sound. So whoosh, can you just do that? Put your tongue behind your teeth, kind of make an O with your mouth and go whoosh. Ready? There's actually a good reason for this. Uh, when you whoosh, you slow down the air. It's sort of putting the brakes on the air and tricking your body into believing that it's slowing down and therefore starting to fall asleep. So it's a way of regulating physiology. You do this a uh, few times in a cycle. You can you do it measured. So I'm going to give you a tempo as we do this. And then at the end, we do a little bit of sound awareness and, and I'll, I'll take you through that. So here we go. Sit up nice and tall. Relaxed. And let's begin. Ready? Breathe in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoosh. Two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. Relax. Let's do two more cycles. And in, two, three, fill up. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax. Let your breathing return to normal. Let's do one more. In, two, three, four. Hold, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whoosh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Relax, let your breathing return to normal. And just notice your breathing for just a few moments without interfering. Notice any sounds in the room. Okay, great. Okay, um, it's a really simple little thing. For me, I need about five or six of those cycles to, sh to slow down. Some people need two or three. I do this before I teach or whenever I'm nervous, before I conduct. Um, and yeah, it does a little, it's a little bit like breathing gym. Um, and by the way, I'm not recommending this as a way to breathe during your everyday life. Okay. Uh, this is not something if some wind players, for example, get really freaked out that I, they think I'm telling them to breathe this way when they play their instrument. No, what you're doing here is when we are asleep, our bodies naturally exhale longer than they inhale. So this sort of tricks the body into believing that you have slowed down. And by focusing at the end on sounds, what you're doing is you're shutting down that default mode network I talked about before. The part that's too focused on the future and in the past, you basically create an incompatible cognitive behavior is what we call it. You're focusing, which means you have very little bandwidth available to ruminate and think about something else. So just out of curiosity, if you could just tell me on the, on the chat there, how many of you felt at least moderately more relaxed or a little less uh, stressed after that? Let me see if, yeah, okay, yay. Okay, great. Yeah, it's useful. And if it isn't useful, um, that, that's, uh, it's okay. Uh, I do one or two other things. You could either do it for a little bit longer. Um, or, or if you or if you want to, uh, you know, you can just, you know, just take a do a longer exhalation, right? Okay, by the way, this is beautiful for kids as well. They absolutely love this process. 
that's called breathe it down. I'm going to move on to my next exercise. All right, the mindful stop. Uh, I just taught a, a workshop at University of Michigan last week. Um, uh, it was an entire five-day workshop on mindfulness with some of their MME students. And, and I'm, I'm presenting practices to you today that they really liked. So this is based on feedback um, from, from a lot of folks, right? So mindful stop is, is a way to sort of catch ourselves before we go into a Zoom session or before we go into a situation with another person. And basically the, the premise here is um, emotional contagion, right? Sometimes we go into a situation and we are taking the baggage from a previous situation into a new situation. And often our kids are the beneficiaries of our bad mood. So for example, I'm on the phone, I get a bad news about the house I'm trying to sell in Florida that I've been selling for, trying to sell for 13 years after the market trash and I'm furious, right? And then I go, oh my gosh, I have to go teach now. And I go into the room and I'm trying to be nice, but the kids notice my body language is different. My tone of voice is different, right? And often it's too late. It takes just a few minutes and we realize, oh my goodness, I'm spreading this to my kids. They're feeling stressed and anxious because I am not able to control or at least regulate my ability to uh, uh, work with my emotions. So this is a really simple exercise that I try with people um, and with myself and my students it's called Mindful Stop. Um, and we'll do it right now. Basically, you just stop. Before you do anything, you just literally physically pause your body. Stop what you're doing. Put your phone down. Just take a complete stop. I like the previous exercise. We take just a few deep breaths. So just breathe in deeply and breathe out slowly. Do one more. And I want you just for a minute to just kind of scan your body and notice if there's any tension anywhere. Just kind of like you're taking a picture of your body and you're noticing there's tension. If you're feeling tension somewhere, can you put your hand on that particular spot? So for me, it's my jaw. And I want you to imagine that you're breathing air. I know this is not actually physically possible, but imagine you're breathing air into the tense spot. And then that you're exhaling tension from that spot. Now I want you to become aware of your mood. Sometimes we're not even aware of the mood we're in. And don't do this with any judgment. You can sort of just go, hmm, feeling cranky, feeling happy, feeling tense. Just kind of notice what your mood is like for a moment. And then I want you to notice what your head, what's going through your head at this moment. So sometimes we tell ourselves a story about a situation. We got sort of like an inner narrative going. I want you to notice what your inner narrative is like for just a moment. Without judgment, you're just noticing it. Cool. And P, the last part of this is to think, okay, wait a minute. Are my thoughts useful right now if my goal, I'm proceeding with intention, if my goal is to learn something from this session, for example, or to have a good class or to be kind to my students, are my thoughts supporting that right now? And if not, can I let those thoughts go and reconnect with whatever it is my intention is? So if I'm intending to be kind, doesn't mean that I don't have the right to be upset or that I'm devaluing my feelings, but can I, can I let them go for just a little bit and uh, just cultivate a sense of kindness and intention for, that I'm gonna be kind to myself and my students for a little while. Assume a dignified presence, bring your mind to your goals, and then you move on, right? This is a really powerful technique because it really gets us, it interrupts our habitual pattern. And I don't know about you, but I will often go three or four hours where I'll go, oh my gosh, where has my mind been doing the last three or four hours? I've been going on autopilot. And the thing with autopilot is that we feel productive, but if we're not careful when we're in autopilot and we're not noticing our emotions and our moods, we tend to act in ways that are inconsistent with our values, right? So this is a really wonderful way of reconnecting. If your point is to be kind to your students, reminding yourself, yeah, my, my mood and posture and breath and tension are incompatible with that right now. Can I either suspend that 
non-judgmentally and re-engage with what's going on? Or is there something else I can do to bring my mood back? By the way, sometimes you can just be vulnerable with your students. I highly recommend sometimes I just come in and say, hey, guys, I'm having a pretty bad day. <laughs> you want to do this mindful stop or breathing with me? And they actually really appreciate that because it makes you human, right? Instead of superhuman. Okay. Mindful stop. I'm going to go to the next two here. Mindful self-compassion. This is from research from Kristen Neff. And I got to tell you, this is the one the teachers have the hardest time with. Um, so actually, before I do that, I want to do, I'm going to share something else. Um, I'm going to show you a video example of, of that last exercise here through one of my favorite videos. Um, let's see. Do you guys see two little like cartoon characters? Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to show you that mindful stop technique here uh, based on a video by, um, by Dan Harris. You may have heard this word mindfulness. It's become something of a buzz phrase of late. I'm going to give you one simple serviceable definition, which is this. Mindfulness is the ability to know what's happening in your head at any given moment without getting carried away by it. Imagine how useful this could be. Just as an example, you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off in traffic. How do you normally react? I think most of us, we normally react by having a thought, which is, I'm pissed. And then what happens next? You immediately, habitually, reflexively inhabit that thought. You actually become pissed. There's no buffer between the stimulus and your reaction with just a little bit of mindfulness, in that same situation, you might notice my chest is buzzing, my ears are turning red, I'm having a starburst of self-righteous thoughts, I'm getting angry. But you don't necessarily have to act on it and chase that person down the road, screaming at them with your kids in the back of the car thinking you've gone nuts. Now, you might be thinking, don't I need to get angry sometimes? Aren't I justified? I would say yes, but probably not as much as you think. The proposition here is not that you should be rendered by mindfulness into some lifeless, non-judgmental blob. The proposition is that you should learn how to respond wisely to things that happen to you rather than just reacting blindly. And that, my friends, is a superpower. How do you get it? The way to get it is through meditation. I believe that meditation and mindfulness are the next big public health revolution. In the 1940s, if you told somebody you were going running, they would have said, who's chasing you? But then what happened next? The scientists swooped in. They showed that physical exercise is really good for you. And now all of us do it. And if we don't, we feel guilty about it. And that's where I think we're headed with mindfulness and meditation. It's going to join the pantheon of no-brainers like brushing your teeth, eating well, and taking the meds your doctor prescribed for you. Let me just close by saying mindfulness is not going to solve all of your problems. It's not going to render your life a nonstop parade of unicorns and rainbows. Nonetheless, this is a superpower and one that is accessible by you immediately. <laughs> yeah, I love that Lorraine said, except you'll observe that you feel guilty and deal with that wisely. That's exactly right. Yeah, we don't actually uh, negate any of our feelings. We just deal with them a little bit more wisely, right? And that's actually what we're going to get to next. This is uh, self-compassion. And we're going to start by taking a little quiz here because I like to be interactive during my uh, my sessions. Um, self-compassion research by Neff is pretty clear. Basically, she looks at uh, what what happens to people when they are kind to themselves rather than excessively judgmental, when they see their problems as part of a common human problem instead of isolation. In other words, am I, when I have problems, do I see myself as the only person having these problems or do I feel like, yeah, we're all in this together? And then mindfulness over, uh, over identification. In other words, when I, when I notice these things, am I over identified, am I stuck, am I ruminating on them or do I have some distance from them? So I'm gonna just do a really quick quiz. Uh, as usual, these are these are just you know, sort of uh, validated psychometric skills, fancy word for saying quizzes that probably predict something, <laughs> right? Uh, and this is the self-compassion scale by Neff. It's only uh, it's about twelve questions. It's very easy. So if if you feel like when you I give you these questions, uh, one is I almost never experience this. Five is I almost always experience this. So let's just see where your self-compassion is. One is almost never experienced. Five is almost always. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Take a look at the three questions. You can write one, two, three, and just write your number beside it. And I do actually encourage you to try this. Uh. 
Okay, in about 30 more seconds, answer them quickly. Don't think about them too much. Let's go to the next three. Sorry, spent 30 more seconds there. Thirty more seconds. I know I'm going quickly, but I want to make sure we get to everything. Not very mindful of me. <laughs> Hurry up and be mindful, Frank. <laughs> and let's do the last three here. Okay. I apologize, but I'm going to ask you to do some math here in a minute. <laughs> All right, let's do a quick score here if you want to do it. Um, so if you, for items two and six, just add up those two scores. For items 11 and 12, we're going to do reverse scoring. So if you have never done a reverse score, all that means is if you wrote a one, make that a five. If you wrote a two, make it a four, okay? Okay. And if you wrote a three, keep it at a three. So for items 11 and 12, if you have a one, make it a five, two, make it a four. If it's a three, uh, make it a three. Yes, I can go back to seven and eight again here in a second. Um, and everything else uh, is the same, but you also reverse scores for four and eight. Okay, so that's another one where one is really a five, four is really uh, a two, and three is a three. I'm going to go back to seven and eight real quick for folks. All right. All right, go ahead and add those up, divide by 12, and then sort of look at where your final score is. By the way, teachers are usually absolutely awful at this. Um, we have been conditioned to not be very kind to ourselves. It's just, it, it, it's, it's a weird thing. And, and I suffer from it just as much. Um, and I'm just curious if, if you're willing to share, I just always like to see in the chat, can you sort of give me your number? If you want to, I just kind of want to see where, where the sort of group range is. Where, where are you on this? Okay. Interesting. All right. Oh, there we go. Now we're seeing it. Moderate, two to five. Okay, good. All right. Some of your... Okay. Yeah, no one, uh, very few people are scoring above three, right? So we're, we're, we don't have a lot of self-compassion. By the way, self-compassion is different than self-esteem. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we are, yes, I will send you this PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, so so self-esteem is I'm awesome. I'm great. I feel good about it. That's not what this is. Self-compassion is I'm allowed to make mistakes and I'm, I'm a flawed person. Okay. Uh, I, I am perfectly okay, not be not saving the world all the time. All right. So what do we know? People who have higher self-compassion tend to have less fear of failure, which is, I think, a pretty good thing uh, for teachers, general reductions in depression, and anxiety, and there's some associations with pro-social behavior. So the higher you rate on those scales, the more likely you are to be uh, kinder to other people. Right. And again, it, it's, it, I think it's, it makes sense on some level, uh, but but the problem is how do you do this, right? How do you engage this? So I'm going to take you. Actually, I got to ask John, how much time do I have? Because uh, it started at two ten. I was aiming for about thirty to forty minutes, but well, we can do about fifteen twenty minutes. Oh, okay. Bit. I'm great. I'm great. All right. So um, here, here, actually, let's do this. We're going to do a quick self guide. Is a five minute self compassion break. Uh, again, the question is, do I actually do this? Yes. Do I do it with cynical uh, college students who are skeptical of everything? 
Yes. Uh, does it turn them into blobs? No. I work at the Jacob School. We don't have blobs, folks. The f to get into the school is pretty competitive. So these kids already come in with quite a bit of, <laughs> how do you say, mental stress and lack of self-compassion. It's usually the reason they're there. Uh, so these exercises are really, really good for to, to help bring them back down. So if you're an overachiever, if you're the kind of person who feels like you're driven in a particular way, just remember, this doesn't have to be your life all the time. It can just be a little break during the day uh, where, where you're a little kind to yourself. So we're going to go ahead and do one of these. This is by Kristen Neff. And all you have to do is sit back and listen. This practice is called the self-compassion break. And it's something you can do any time during the day or at night when you need a little self-compassion. So to practice this exercise, we actually need to call up a little suffering. So I invite you to think about a situation in your life right now that is difficult for you. Maybe you're feeling stress or you're having a relationship problem or you're worried about something that might happen. I'd invite you to think of something that is difficult, but not overwhelmingly difficult, especially if you're new to practicing the self-compassion break. So finding a situation and getting in touch with it, what's going on, what happened, or what might happen, who said what, really bring the situation to life in your mind's eye. And then I'm going to be saying a series of phrases that are designed to help us remember the three components of self-compassion when we need it most. So the first phrase is, this is a moment of suffering, right? We're bringing mindful awareness to the fact that suffering is present. And I'd invite you to find some language that speaks to you. Something like, this is really hard right now. Or, I'm really struggling. We're actually turning toward our difficulty, acknowledging it, naming it. This is a moment of suffering. The second phrase is, suffering is a part of life. Okay, we're reminding ourselves of our common humanity. Suffering is a part of life. And again, finding language that speaks to you. It may be something like, it's not abnormal to feel this way. Many people are going through similar situations. Right, the degree of suffering may be different. The flavor of suffering may be different. But suffering is a part of life part of being human. And then the third phrase is, may I be kind to myself in this moment. And to support bringing kindness to yourself, I'd invite you to perhaps put your hands over your heart or some other place on your body that feels soothing and comforting feeling the warmth of your hands, the gentle touch, letting those feelings of care stream through your fingers. May I be kind to myself. And using any language that supports that sense of kindness Perhaps language you would use with a good friend you cared about who was going through a very similar situation. You know, it may be something like, I'm here for you. It's going to be okay. I care about you. 
You can even try using a diminutive if that feels comfortable. You know, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Or you can try calling yourself by your first name. Anything that feels natural to express your deep wish that you be well and happy and free from suffering. Okay. Um, so despite the fact that, um, you know, th th that can be a really difficult exercise for a lot of people, we're not often taught to. So it, it is incredibly effective. I am really skipping over a lot of the data today because this is geared towards the practices more. Uh, but, but I can tell you that um, over three weeks, uh, folks doing these twice a week, uh, it actually changes them on those scales that you saw uh, recently. And we actually find uh, that people who practice self-compassion exercises have uh, it show different, uh, show plasticity in the brain in areas associated with self-regulation and emotion. So it has a really important uh, impact on you, on your well-being and your health. So I would encourage you to do those. And by the way, yes, I will send this uh, PowerPoint out. I don't know, John, I'll send it to you. It'll have all the links. It'll have all the information so that you can, can access it. Okay. So a couple of pedagogical things to do. Number one is um, I, with students, if you want to use the students, I kind of use the scale as a way of asking them questions, just checking in during class, um, I, or just, just a couple of questions, like a shortened version, use them as prompts. Um, I model it for my students. I try to be nice to myself as often as I can. I know many of us are self-deprecating. You can still be self-deprecating and still pat yourself on the back. Actually, you can still be, my goodness, that was really screwed up, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm going to be all right. Um, and then finally, um, I like to add these to my LMS. So if I have a lear learning management system, I have a, a page that has meditations and kids can click on it and they can use it. Um, I use them. And, and more importantly, uh, at IU next year, and I started doing it a little bit of this last year, I have a, a, a time, a 30 minute once a week drop in for any of my students where we work on a, a short meditation and then we just hang out and connect with each other, right? So it just gives us the opportunity to, to, to get outside of the Zoom world as a, as a learning tool and more as in, in you know, can, can we just share some time together? All right, so I just wanna show that to you. A few more things. Um, this is research on uh, something called gra uh, gratitude studies, right? Uh, I'm gonna tell you one last exercise that's really powerful for me, which is uh, gratitude. Uh, folks who, uh, who tend to be more grateful um, uh, are, are experience less physical symptoms, like less, uh, less pain, have generally better life experience and more optimism, right? They attain goals better and they also have more pro-social behaviors. Uh, this is from research in, at, in 2003 by Emmons and McCollum. But here's, here's what this research uh, actually is based on. This is a reproduction of this by uh, Dr. Wong, who's one of our education professors here at IU. This is what they did. They had three groups. They had one group write a letter, a gratitude letter for someone that they loved or that they really appreciated. And they, it was just to express their gratitude. Those folks did that. They had another group that wrote <laughs> wrote about their negative experiences. <laughs> uh, and then there was a group that did nothing at all. Okay. So you had three groups. They compared the effects of the feelings of, of, of well-being in these three groups uh, 12 weeks later, right? So, so at different points to see if they had any shelf life. Well, the folks that wrote the gratitude levels, uh, gratitude letters, not surprisingly, actually had less negative words, which is not surprising, but it predicted better mental health up to 12 weeks later. Something about expressing gratitude in a simple letter can be really, really powerful. Uh, there was also some neurological data that was increases in the medial prefrontal cortex for the gratitude group. And the MPC is associated with learning and decision-making. So there were actual, again, changes to the brain 12 weeks later from simply doing something as simple as writing a gratitude letter. So what I do with my students is I, actually incorporate the, a gratitude wall, or, or I do it for myself. I've done this exercise where I try to write a letter to somebody that I just haven't expressed gratitude for something. It makes me feel incredibly better. It changes my attention, my focus to something that's more positive in my life and that I can control, right? I can control having gratitude for someone, even if I can't control everything that's going on around me. And it's a really wonderful way to get your kids to, to think about some pro-social uh, behaviors and attitudes. Okay. Um, so again, I do that as uh, I have a gratitude wall where people write little comments to each other about things that they thought were, uh, they were grateful for. We even have them at IU. Our, our cynical uh, professors also write each other little notes <laughs> saying, hey, I really appreciate that Frank did this thing. It goes on a wall and it's really interesting to see people be like, oh, 
yeah, like there are nice things going on, right? Um, and then they could do this as a letter to a friend in class, a grandfather, a grandparent, something like that. Really quick, there is a support for mindfulness and SEL. All of the things, those of you who have castle competencies, uh, just, know, just know that mindfulness does support this, like the stop includes a body scan and noticing thoughts and stories. So it supports self-awareness and management. Um, a mindful listening and intentional action is also supported by the stop. The body scan and mindful listening, uh, which is something you can do, you can add sort of an, an element to that mindful stop as well of listening to other people and interrupting your judgments is really helpful and perspective taking. Uh, all of these things are supported by some of the practices that I shared with you today. Like for example, changing my perspective from what's going wrong in my life to gratitude can be a really powerful way of actually helping uh, to make us make, make better decisions. Okay, final slide. All right, I started with Mr. Rogers, <laughs> ending with Mr. Rogers. Uh, you know, we, we can't help our feelings. Uh, it, it's just what they are. I, I, for a long time, fought very much with feelings of guilt for being angry or stressed about things, feelings of wanting to save the world. What I realized is my feelings are my feelings. They are what they are. It's what I do with them that really matters. And if I can manage them better, I think I can serve as a better model for my students. Um, and, and also importantly is, you know, to, to um, as I'm learning to work with my feelings, right? Uh, as I learn to, to, to be less judgmental is to accept that everybody has these, right? You know, we're, we're not alone. If you talk to, you know, social media is a terrible way of thinking uh, about how people actually exist, right? We tend to either show what we, we, we curate our personalities and people think every, everything's either honky dory or falling apart. More people are more complex than that. And, and when we take time to realize, you know, we're probably all suffering a little bit, it helps us in a sort of shared humanity to, to maybe instead of spend a lot of time uh, criticizing and tearing each other down, to maybe helping each other work together to, to overcome some of the obstacles that we're doing. So that's my presentation today. I, I don't know how much time we have for uh, questions, but um, thank you for coming. I appreciate you being here and learning about these uh, practices with me. Frank, thank you very much. If we were in a, a large conference room together, I'm sure there would be a, a lot of applause occurring. Um, let's see. I, one question that someone asked asked me to uh, ask you is to uh, share an example or a story of you using this in a, in a rehearsal setting or a large ensemble setting. Oh, lovely. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in a large ensemble, I like to use mindful stop. And so what happens about 20 to 30 minutes into a rehearsal, kids are in habitual mode. They're starting to get frustrated. Uh, their, their, their brains are somewhere else. And rather than just then get mad at them or say, hey, gosh, get your attention back here. So it's their fault. I just say, hey, everybody, let's stop. And I'm going to stop with you. And I just say, can we just take a moment, pause, put your instrument down, roll your shoulders. Let's take three breaths together. And I'll say, hey, just, just notice through your body. Are you feeling any tension right now? It's really amazing. The minute that they realize there's tension in their body, the tension tends to dissipate a little bit because they're aware of it. They're like, oh yeah, I've been holding my left hand in a very tense position. So by just being aware, oh, my left hand is tense, I tend to relax it, right? I don't have to do much. I just have to be aware. Then I check in with their moods and I tell them, hey, if you're feeling frustrated right now, I call it normalizing frustration. Frustration is part of being a musician. We all get frustrated. Don't worry about it. If you get frustrated, that means you care. Let's just do something with that frustration that's that's uh, meaningful, right? And then finally, I say, okay, what do you want out of these? The you know, I check in with their th thoughts. I say, what are you thinking about? Do you think those thoughts are going to help you accomplish your goals? Why or why not? And I say, well, what are some thoughts that might help you accomplish your goals in the next few minutes? And it's just a really nice way to just stop and, and integrate a moment of mindfulness into a rehearsal. By the way, question is, who, middle schoolers, I've done it with middle schoolers. I've done it with the North Carolina High School All-State Group. Uh, you know, very high level musicians who are there to play. They appreciate this kind of stuff. A lot of them are actually quite self-critical. Uh, so you'd be surprised, especially for your overachievers, how, how nice it is to just give them a moment to pause, right? And, and just take stock. Yeah, it, it, it's, really it's really great to hear, hear all this stuff from you, from you because not, not only are you a, a, prolific, a prolific researcher, I mean, you're, you're a phenomenal musician and you work with students and conduct everything. And usually, you know, when we think musician, we don't think all of this evidence-based, researchy, medical type stuff. So I, it, it's really great. Oh. Someone's. Sorry, my microphone gets all, all wonky. <laughs> but I mean, we, we usually don't think, you know, musician as a really scientific, researchy based type of person. 
So sure. it, it's, it's really great that you're, you're showing all of this literature to us, but also relating it in our musical context when we're teaching with, with students and everything. So I, I think we have time for one or two questions. Are there any, anyone that wants to ask anything in the chat before we conclude with Frank Diaz? Any final words from you, Frank? No, I, re I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come to this session. Uh, more than ever, more than ever this year, we have to work on being kind to ourselves and others. I, I cannot emphasize enough uh, to my fellow teachers. Folks, if you're not well, it is very difficult to be there for your students. Uh, we all want to help. We all want to work with people, but, but, but that requires having the, the cognitive, emotional fuel right? The wellness so that we can support our students. So if you don't want to do it for, if you're maybe the kind that's like, oh, I, I can suck it up. Take care of yourself. When you take care of yourself, you can take care of your students and we're going to be a lot uh, better for it. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh yeah. I, okay. Actually, that's a great question, Renata. Um, I, actually, I, I got to address this. Uh, trauma. Uh, I, I could spend an entire session on this as I do trauma informed mindfulness. I want to make it really clear to everyone that your kids should have the option of opting out of these at any moment. You never force them to do it. You always say, look, if you're feeling uncomfortable or if you don't want to try this exercise, that's perfectly fine. There are kids with deeply traumatic experiences that ex that, that can be triggered. It's, it's rare, but it can happen. And you want to make sure that you give the kids the option to opt out. On the other hand, sometimes when kids experience this, uh, they come to you and they say, you know what, I experienced something I hadn't thought about before and I want to share it with you, which gives you the opportunity to send them for help or resources that you might not be able to give them. So I think it's a wonderful question, Renata. Thank you so much. Uh, don't force them to close your eyes. Just let them do what they do. Let them follow it the way that they want to follow it and always give them the option to opt out. You'll find eventually that many of them will come to it if they're comfortable doing it, uh, but that there's always going to be some kids that uh, won't, won't want to, and that's perfectly okay. That, those are my final words. <laughs> All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, All right, thank you, Drake.